Throughout the 1960s, creator and producer Erwin Allen was a highly creative and imaginative force on television, creating four highly successful TV shows, which were filmed at 20th Century Fox. His first series, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, was a highly successful spin-off series of the 1961 feature film of the same name, which was directed by Erwin Allen. With the show's success, the network asked Allen to produce a follow-up series called Lost in Space, which would air on TV between 1965 and 1968. Inspired by the 1812 novel, The Swiss Family Robinson, well-respected science fiction writer and director Ib Melchior of films like The Angry Red Planet and The Time Travelers wrote an original screenplay titled Space Family Robinson. In 1960, the Gold Key comic book series of the same name in 1962 was then released. This comic book was considered to be the main inspiration for Lost in Space, but this was actually not true. Melchior's screenplay would actually act as the main inspiration for Erwin Allen to create Lost in Space, a show which was originally given the title of the Melchior script, Space Family Robinson. Sadly, Melchior never received the credit he deserved for the original story and concept. Incidentally, Erwin Allen's original pilot, No Place to Hide, was almost a carbon copy of Melchior's screenplay. Erwin Allen would sell the concept of Lost in Space, pitching the idea to CBS head James Aubrey, who thought Lost in Space would have major commercial appeal and bought the series. A couple of months before his meeting with Allen, he would reject an original pitch by Gene Roddenberry, for Star Trek. In preparation for the series, Erwin Allen was keen to enlist the help of NASA, who were interested because they saw this as a great way to promote the space program. But after many conversations with Allen, they would realize that he had no interest at all in being scientifically accurate, so they turned him down. A pilot was filmed with the main actors cast, all except the characters Dr. Smith and the robot who weren't in the original pilot. During the preview screening of the pilot, titled No Place to Hide, Owen Allen was horrified to hear the CBS executives laughing. Allen was ready to leave when story editor Anthony Wilson told him to stay because he believed they liked it. He was right. They were laughing because they realized that they were onto a real winner. However, there needed to be a few changes made. The characters Dr. Smith and the robot were added to the new pilot to bring more jeopardy to the story. The writers made Dr. Smith the Sabotar, who finds himself stuck on the ship, becoming a stowaway. Originally, the name of the ship was the Gemini 12, but the name was changed to the Jupiter 2 in order to avoid confusion with the current space program the original pilot version would never be aired. For the character of Dr. Zachary Smith, they approached a number of actors, including Carol O'Connor and Victor Bjorno, but it was character actor Jonathan Harris who would get the part. The part that I was given to play was a terrible spy villain. Already we were in trouble because I hated him. I not only hated him, but I said, oh, five shows and I'm out. They're going to have to kill me. Dr. Smith was supposed to be killed off after the sixth episode originally, oh, really? and uh, the response <coughs> to his character was so great that they decided to keep him on the show. And to keep him on the show, you couldn't have him try to murder us week after week. <laughs> <laughs> Harris began rewriting his dialogue and redefining his character. To be a deep, dark, snarling villain, which I have played in my time, there is no longevity in these parts. You have to kill them off because they're so bad. And I thought, in five shows, they'll kill me off and I'll be again jobless. I am justly famous for comedic villainy. That's what I love to do. And I started to sneak in my little comedic bits, hoping the boss wouldn't notice. He noticed. And then a most miraculous thing happened. For the first and only time in my career, which is vast, he came to my dressing room and he said, I know what you're doing, and I said, uh, oh, and he said, do more. In all the opening titles for all of the three seasons, Jonathan Harris was given the billing of special guest star. This was actually Harris's idea, which Erwin Allen agreed to. So I called Erwin, and I said, I've solved your billing problem. I said, I will accept last billing. 
special guest star, Jonathan Harris, every week. Well, you should have heard me. And you stupid bastards, none of you can act anyway. You're not a good actor. None of you are, are a good actor. I don't have to put up with this crap. I just sat there and on and on and on and then, okay, and he hung up. Despite Harris being credited as a special guest star in every episode, the character Smith became a pivotal character of the series, even getting more screen time than the lead actors. The main actors had already been cast and had been in the original pilot. Actors like Guy Williams, well known for starring as Zorro in the Zorro TV series, was cast as Professor John Robinson, an astrophysicist who specializes in applied planetary geology he also acts as the expedition commander. June Lockhart, daughter of star Jean Lockhart, already had an extensive career in films, starring in supporting roles in films like Meet Me in St. Louis. But during the 50s, she was mostly known for playing the mum on the TV series Lassie. She was cast as Dr. Maureen Robinson. Uh, the, the part really began as a biophysicist and then sort of uh, uh, never really developed far from into that at all. But basically but they didn't think of women as bodies. Not in those days. Major Don West was played by Mark Goddard. He had starred in a multitude of TV shows before starring in Lost in Space. My agent said to me, uh, there's a pilot going called Lost in Space that Irwin's doing. Would you like to do it? And I said, well, science fiction. This is before any science fiction shows were on. I said, I'm not interested in science fiction. No, I had done a Western series called Johnny Ringo, I did the detectives, you know. But he said, well, just do it. Nobody will ever see it. They're doing the pilot, Take, make a few bucks. And so I signed to do the pilot. And uh, I didn't test for it or anything. They just wanted me and I, and uh, it sold. And the agent that got me involved, he became a vice president over at 20th Century Fox that was producing it. So he had a good thing going. Judy Robinson was played by the beautiful Marta Christen. And I had done a show where I played a high wire walker. And uh, Irwin Allen saw that and said, I want that girl. Uh, so I came in to audition for him and I wore big earrings, which he loved, and a pink suit. I mean, he just, oh, he, that's the one. And uh, so that was it. He handpicked me. And I, I, didn't, I didn't have to um, do any screen test. I mean, there were screen tests being made, but I didn't want to take the part right away because uh, Although I loved science fiction, I was just beginning my career and I thought, oh, I'm going to be pigeonholed, and, uh, but it turns out that it was one of the best decisions I ever made. While the younger sister, Penny, was played by child star Angela Cartwright, who starred in the TV series The Danny Thomas Show and the classic musical The Sound of Music. How much time was there between The Sound of Music coming out and you transforming into Miss Penny Robinson? Not a whole lot of time. Uh, I started doing some Lost in Space about a year later. I was 13 and that was on the 20th lot. When Sound of Music ended, I actually stayed on the studio lot and did my schooling there. <laughs> um, I, I think they wanted to put me into something else, but they didn't know what they were going to do with me. And then uh, Irwin Allen's uh, Lost in Space came along and I was cast in that. And that was kind of a a cult role, you know. To this day, there are so many fans of that television show. And that was a good time for you, that series? You had fun on that? Yes, yes, that was a good, good experience. Billy Mooney, known child actor who had already starred in many movies and TV shows, including Alfred Hitchcock Presents and The Twilight Zone, was cast as child prodigy Will Robinson, the youngest of the Robinson kids. In 1964, I co-starred in a movie for 20th Century Fox with Jimmy Stewart called Dear Bridget. It was a 20th Century Fox film. Irwin Allen, who created and produced uh, Lost in Space, was on the 20th Century Fox lot, and the part was offered to me. I never auditioned for it. It was just uh, offered to me. When Lost in Space came along, it was exactly what had motivated me at the age of four to get inside the television. It was a superhero. It was like Superman and Zorro. But Will Robinson was everything I had ever wanted 
he had a laser gun and he used it. How cool was that? How many kids on TV have a laser gun and get to use it? It's not that he just had one, he used it. He could fly the ship, he could program the robot. For like 83 hours, he was the guy who figured it out and saved the day. I loved every single second of Lost in Space. The robot was played and controlled by Bob May. The robot is a B9 model robot that was never given a name, so he's mostly referred to as the robot. Later in the series, the robot would inherit more human qualities and traits. The robot was in fact designed by Robert Kenoshita, famed designer of Robbie the Robot from the film Forbidden Planet in 1956. Incidentally, Robbie appeared in the episode of Lost in Space titled War of the Robots, where the robot battles Robbie. The robot was voiced by actor Dick Tufield, who would also narrate the show. From my, from my point of view, he was the robot. The person who was in the robot fit in the robot, and that's why he was there. But Dick developed a character. Everything that happened with the robot is mine, and I take credit. During the run of the series, Jonathan Harris would invent a sort of comedy routine between him and the robot where Smith would be calling the robot many names. So all those phrases come from you. I wrote everything you heard. Bubble-headed booby. Bubble-headed booby. The end of whole ninny. Yes. Oh, what's my peripatetic pipsqueak. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. <laughs> I dreamed them all up, you know. They were, that's, that yeah. is what a lot of us take away from that experience. Yeah. Run away, run away, and oh, will you, you know, the pain, the pain. The pain, all the pain. That came out of something quite real. I had a terrible back that day. Oh, did you? I have a delicate back to begin with. <laughs> I mean, that's real. And it was a bad back day, it really was. <laughs> and in the middle of a scene, it was an ad lib. <laughs> I think Billy Mooney had said something, and I, I had wanted me to do something, and I said, oh, I couldn't do the pain. <laughs> <laughs> and that remained part of the lexicon of Lost in Space, which was lovely. Penny, during the run of Lost in Space, had an alien pet named Debbie, played by Judy the Chimpanzee. Debbie would make her debut in the first season episode, Island in the Sky. Debbie is referred to in the show as Bloop. If you enjoyed this video and like what you see on my channel, please subscribe. And if you would like to become a patron on my Patreon, click on the link below.